There's many subjects that we can talk about during the days of living bread. But I want to begin with this. We're going to do a little bit of reading, so bear with me, and we'll probably try and get you out of here by at least 6, 6.30. <laughs> In the aftermath of the Civil War and the Emancipation Proclamation, which was technically written and delivered prior to the end by Abraham Lincoln before the war ended, the slaves were free. What is interesting and almost strange is that many of those slaves that had lived for generations as slaves on the plantations did not have any idea what they were going to do with their freedom. They hadn't a clue. All their lives they'd lived on a plantation. They'd lived as slaves, treated as slaves. Basically, they were subhuman. It wasn't until many years later they were even allowed to vote and were considered as human beings. They were considered three-fourths or four-eighths or five-eighths of an individual. They had no idea where they would go. They had no idea what they would do or how their new life would be. They, by and large, most, not all, most had no formal education of any kind. So the data shows us that untold thousands remained as a slave's capacity. They never left the plantation. They never left their status as a slave because they knew no other world. Those that did go out, those that were freed, were left to a world they did not understand and was still treating them badly. In his book, Sick from Freedom, author Jim Downs estimates that 25% of the freed slaves who did leave died of disease and related suffering. But it was those who chose their old life in some way I'd like to concentrate on today. So I'd like to discuss with you the concept, strangely as it may sound, of bondage, of a self-imposed aspect as it relates in turn to the concepts of Passover, the days of unleavened bread, and, and one of my children knew I was going to bring this up, the wave sheep offering. That's what makes it a triple Sabbath. Tomorrow the count begins. I'm not a psychologist, but I played one in TV. I'm kidding. It's a commercial on TV now. So I can't practice psychology. I don't have a license, but I can read just like you can. And I took some classes way back when, and I can try and understand the aspects of psychology. When one, as a definition, has a resultant reaction to their captor over a period of time after they have been freed from that captor, and they still have a positive reaction to that individual, it's known as Stockholm Syndrome. How many of you have heard the term? I just saw quite a few. Oh, a few of you. Yeah. Let me, for those, for the two people that don't know, uh, many of you, let me explain what Stockholm Syndrome is. Is when a hostage begins to feel affections of trust towards their captor. The name of this psychological dog diagnosis comes from the hostage situation that occurred in Stockholm, Sweden in August of 1973, where a convict named Jack Eric Olson on leave from prison, ended up conducting an armed robbery in a bank. Someone was able to hit the silent alarm button, but Olson was able to wound the policeman who came to rescue. He made demands of money, a car, and even the release of a friend in prison. He then held hostages. The police met his demands because of those hostages. However, Olson required that he was able to leave with four hostages to ensure his escape. The police refused. While the hostages were inside waiting the outcome of what and whether they were going to be rescued, it is said that Olson comforted them. He gave them a jacket to, to one who was cold. He allowed movement for another who was claustrophobic. He allowed phone calls to their family. The hostages began to form a bond with him and to the point where one of the testimonies that was, he treated us well. Hostages reported more fear of the police than of Olson. They even defended Olson in their testimonies that he had not hurt them. He was barely convicted of the crime because of the testimony of those that he had held hostage. Stockholm Syndrome is said to occur for several possible reasons and motivations. Because the victim sympathizes with their captor for survival, it grows a bond after being with them for a while, begins to share values, or the captor in some way, even in the smallest way, nurtures them. We can easily see that captivity, bondage, in many of its different forms, psychological, physical, spiritual, 
theological. It can form from the term learned dependence. I uh, discussed this with a psychologist recently. She said, yes, it's called learned dependence. It's as bad as the, the, the bondage can be, it becomes dependent. It's known, the bondage is known, it's understood, it's accepted. It's the way it is. And therefore they accept it and they know nothing else. I think the special music today, if you listen to the two selections they made, and I'm with Mr. Helge, I, I remember both those songs from way back. They spoke of two completely different aspects, in reverse order, by the way, of these days that we picture. There is more theological development in the spring holy days than at any other time during the year. We got a lot going on. And there's a lot of things I could cover. And there's a lot of things that Mr. Brown could have covered. And there's a lot of things that the other speakers on the second day will cover. But each and, each and every one of us feels a certain aspect speaks to them. But this is a season of recurring history. We recount history. I hope you had a very nice, uh, as, as fractured as we all are, a night to be much observed. It's a very special time of the year. I think it does have a very good biblical footing. It's not a command. It's not a holy day, it's part of a holy day. And I hope you, with whoever you were with, and I know a lot of you had to make uh, different plans because of the situations, we, we knew of at least six. But it's a special time. But it talks about a special time. Passover speaks about a special time 3,500 years ago. It also speaks of a time 2,000 years ago as it relates to us. So it's all about history. Turn with me if you would, we're gonna spend a lot of time in one book. And that's the book of Exodus. Now I'm going to do some reading. I'm going to try and do some commentary, but I want you to listen to the words because I think it's important that we understand this book and the law. Because if you don't understand the law, the Torah, the book of Exodus for these days, you will not have any clue about what Passover means. Keep in mind when the, second, the first century Jews met together as Jesus did with his disciples, this is what they knew. This is what Passover meant to them. It begins in verse 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man in his household came with Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Isaac, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Now you remember the story here in Exodus picks up from Genesis. Where Joseph of Jacob's sons, Joseph had been sold into slavery. He comes through a series of unbelievable events, and I encourage you if you have the time, it's a fascinating story. He comes to great power with Pharaoh. In fact, he's, view, he's viewed to be second or third in command. And Joseph calls for Jacob, his father, and the family, and they all come down to Egypt to avoid the famine. And so that's what these verses recount here. Verse 6, And Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, Look, the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply too late. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built, Pharaoh supply, they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were, indeed, they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel severe with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service and in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor great difficulty. It's emphasized over and over and over again. This was not, this was not the low security prison. This was slavery of its worst form. And the Bible says over and over again with rigor. And that's going to come to bear upon what happens later in the story, which you all know. So as we, as we progress through the book of Exodus, you will see, and as you know, because we do know these, these, this book very well in the story, that things changed. There's a very famous phrase, I, every time I read it, 
it reminds me of a phrase we used in business. There arose a pharaoh in Egypt, unnamed by the way, there arose a pharaoh in Egypt that knew not Joseph, right? Every time we'd get a new boss, after all the good work we'd done for a year, two, three, four, five years, and I see people nodding, they hire some guy. And we got to start all over again because he doesn't care anything about what we did for the last five years. So they arose a pharaoh that knew not Joseph and all the things that Joseph had done. Joseph was a miracle worker. He, was, he interpreted dreams. He helped them avoid the famine. And read the story in Genesis. It's fascinating. That didn't matter. There was a new boss in town. That's bad. Joseph was forgotten. They became slaves under the whip. Horrible conditions. They were in bondage. It was effectively a death camp. And they had been this way for generations. In Exodus chapter 2, we will not read it. It talks about the, 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 the appearance of Moses, miraculously, after they tried to wipe out all the newborns of the Israelites. Moses, as powerful and as great as Moses is in the Old Testament, he gets one chapter about his background. Joseph gets close to 12. Moses, eh, he gets one to talk about his miraculous birth. And he, too, winds up in Pharaoh's house. He's a Hebrew. He meets Jethro, who is a Midian, Midian priest. He marries. And he's content as he has fleed Pharaoh under the threat of death. It's a long story. You know the story. If you don't, read it. But we're going to jump to chapter 3. Now, remember, Moses is in the desert. He's tending animals. He's working technically for his father-in-law, Jethro. In chapter 3, verse 1, we pick up the story. Moses is alone now. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. Now remember, picture this. Angel of the Lord. God, God has presented this and Moses is there. So he, Moses, looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Charlton Heston said, I mean, Moses said, I will, now turn, I will now turn aside. You know, there's probably nobody in this room, irrespective of your age, uh, that didn't get the, didn't get the inference. Then Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, right, as the narrator said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he, God said, the angel of the Lord, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he, he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry, just exactly what we heard in the special music, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up from the land, from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Now, Moses is going to forget to tell them that later on. We'll get to that. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you. To Pharaoh that you may bring my people the children of Israel out of Egypt but Moses said who am I and there's the dialogue that goes back and forth but indeed God convinces Moses with Aaron to confront Pharaoh Moses does indeed deliver Israel through a series of plagues as we know the plagues were were horrible increased in intensity and basically the plagues were against the gods of Egypt. And it's another story for another time. The last one, the last plague, as you recall, that was the clincher. Turn with me all the way back to Exodus chapter 11. I had to pick out what to, to speak on. And I said, well, I got to include that. And I said, no, I'm going to be here. I'll be there all day. And so the reading of it doesn't take that long. So I invite you, if you have the time, just sit and read all the way through uh, the first 10, 15 chapters, 16 chapters, 8, 19, well, 20 is good too, 21, 22. 
Read as much of Exodus as you can. So we're going to uh, jump to chapter 11, verse 1. And the Lord said to Moses, verse 1 of 11, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people, and let every man ask of his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Then Moses says, thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the animals. Then there will be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall it be like again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all those your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all the wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the, ch the children of Israel go out of his land. In chapter 12 is one of the most pivotal in all the Bible. It sets for the framework of what we did just a couple nights ago. Had chapter 12 of Exodus not occurred, we would not have met Thursday night. It wouldn't have happened. It's because of this chapter and the history after it that we did. Chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. This is when the calendar begins. Did anybody notice, by the way, as an astronomical point of reference, uh, what kind of moon is out right now? Full, full moon. Why? Why is it a full moon? Because it's halfway through the month. So uh, when you see Passover arrive, it should be very, very almost dead on to the full moon. So he says, This is a beginning, a beginning of months to you. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You, sh you shall make it, you, shall, you, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with notice very carefully. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs, that's it. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled nor all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with legs and its entrails. If you, you shall not let none of it remain until the morning. And what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with your belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. So shall you eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Well, I always try and remind everyone if I do speak during the days of the bread. Do you know what we do after Passover, what the, the deacons do? What do we do, guys, gals, deaconesses? They take the wine and the bread where we have prayed over it, it's technically consecrated. And we follow the admonition here. This isn't wine anymore. It's been blessed for special purpose. It isn't the blood of Christ and it isn't the body of Christ. It's, it's symbolic. It's very symbolic, but it's still special. So they take the wine and they take care of it as wine. They take the bread and they usually burn it. We did that for years when we were back east. It's destroyed. It can be used for no other purpose. It's a very special part of the Passover service that most people don't ever see and don't ever know about. But that's what our custom is based on these verses here. And so they've got this special night, very special night, and it's the plague and the death of the firstborn. And so they select this lamb, and you, as you read these verses, you can tell very quickly how the representation of the New Testament of this very special lamb and its blood. They eat the lamb, 
They use the blood for protection. I want to break it to you. There's no protection in blood on a doorpost. It doesn't ward off anything unless God's behind it. It was, it was a choice that they had to make. It was a choice that the Israelites had to make to take the blood of that lamb and put it on their doorpost and the lintels. Like the death angel couldn't make it through a window or a skylight. Highly symbolic, but it was a point of obedience. If you do this, you will be protected. And it's all going to happen in one night. And you better be ready because a lot of things are going to be happening really quickly. They had been in slavery for hundreds of years. And as this Passover is instituted, God takes the simplest of elements. He takes the bread without leaven. They remind them that they left in great haste with their belts girded. They're ready to go. The bitter herbs were to remind them of severe bondage and slavery. And there was the lamb, this little lamb who, who really couldn't save anybody, but its blood was representation that it could. In verse 29, we'll skip ahead. In verse 29, there we go. Then it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, and he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. That plague must have been horrific. Then he called Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go out from among my people. Get out, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said, and take your flocks, your herds as you have said. Be gone, and bless me also. I always think that's interesting, right? Bless me also, but get out of here. He doesn't want him anywhere near here. So they were shielded and they were protected and they were delivered. It wasn't the bread, it wasn't the herbs, it was the lamb. They were all required that God said to eat these things, but it was the blood of that lamb that allowed them. In Exodus chapter 13, there's a very interesting phrase. We're just going to skip to it. In Exodus chapter 13, Moses, verse 3, asks the people something very interesting. Verse 3, Moses said to the people of chapter 13, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No living bread shall be eaten. Fascinating. By strength of hand, God has delivered you out of this house of bondage. No unleavened bread shall be eaten. No unleavened bread shall be eaten. The first reminder of unleavened bread, its primary initial reason is haste. You left this bondage in an instant. Can you imagine enduring something, whatever that prison you can imagine in your own mind might be, and it went on for years and years and years, thoughts you had of remorse, of regret, of disappointment, and in one night, it's changed in haste. I think it's a fascinating analogy, one of the many aspects of unleavened bread. By the way, no leavened bread shall be eaten. You were delivered from the house of bondage in one night, quickly. He says in verse 14, same chapter, he says, so it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this that you shall say to him? You know, what is this event? What, is, what are we doing? He says, by strength of hand, you shall say to him, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's why they did it. That's why they had the initial Passover. That's why every Passover afterwards was to commemorate and remember and enshrine that one night that they remembered, that they were taken from the house of bondage. I'd be remiss if I didn't reference, if you want a really good video of these events, there's this thing called Patterns of Evidence that we were exposed to a year and a half ago. Mr. Mahoney, by the way, he says hi. He's working on his next film, and I told him we get first right of refusal when he comes to L.A. But if you want a great representation of the Exodus, very, very accurate, I would remiss if I didn't bring that up. And so the Israelites begin their journey. They're freed. 
through the wilderness to the promised land. Now, for those of you that have a, a, an iPhone or an Android, which I, Android, which I think is, yeah, that's everybody, right? I, I use Google Maps, and I tried to Google Map this from Avaris, or Egypt, to Canaan, the promised land. In a straight line, it's not very far. The problem is there's a desert, some mountains, some valleys. It's very hot. Uh, you got three million people or whatever in, in tow with you. And so the journey, they estimate, archaeologists estimate, that the estimated journey to the promised land for Israel was around 240, 300 miles. On average, that larger group could probably only manage five to 10 miles a day. So there were no Land Rovers at the time. This was all on foot and it's a lot of miles, but still, but still, maybe two, three months, four months at the outside, and they'd be free and they'd be in the promised land. However, it took them 40 years. Mathematically, they averaged about six miles a year instead of a day. They must have had a few stops along the way. Something must have happened. There were issues. Yeah, and they started right away. Exodus 14, verse 1. They are barely out of Egypt. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they may turn the camp at Pihirioth between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For the Pharaohs will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. Bad news. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and all his army. Good news. That the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? that we have let Israel go from serving us. Now, I want you to remember this sentence because there's a lot of bad memory here, right? Pharaoh's got a lousy memory, right? How about the death of the firstborn Pharaoh? That's why you let them go. So why have we done this? That's why. So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness for a while. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, camping by the sea beside pi Harioth before Baal-Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. Picture that in your rearview mirror, right? How many of you have been pulled over in the last two or three weeks? No, I'm not going to ask that. You know what that's like. What did I do, right? It's, it's very jolting, isn't it? I personally have had that happen very often, a very little. Can you, all kidding aside, from our human life, picture what Israel thought. What happened? They're after us again. This unbelievable cloud of dust, they're after us again. They're gonna take us back. The children of Israel cried to the Lord. They were afraid. Then they said to Moses, because, this is a rhetorical question, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? In other words, there were graves in Egypt. They've been burying their dead for generation. It's sarcasm. Were there no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in this wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Ugh, ugh, this must have cut Moses to the quick. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Didn't we tell you this? I mean, Moses is getting it. He's getting it bad. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians, I love this verse, there. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Take a look. You'll never see them again. 
The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. We know what happened. It was the parting of the sea, a miracle of miracles. And they walked upon dry land and got to the other side of the sea. And the sea closed in on the Egyptians. It was a miracle. He said, you'll never see them again. Did they? No, they never did. God and Moses were right. But the people wanted to die in Egypt. And when we read this, when we read this, God did save them again. But note the reaction. As soon as trouble occurred, they said, you know what? Egypt wasn't that, this bad. Egypt wasn't this bad. We could have died there. We were alive. It was a bad life. But hey, better than what we're in right now. We're in the desert. Nowhere to go. The sea's in front of us. Pharaoh behind us. This is a no-win situation. We are boxed in. You should have let us alone in Egypt. How would you have felt if you were Moses? How would you have felt if you were God? After all he had done. It gets worse. Much worse. Because we're going to hold the question. Because they didn't remember the miracle of plagues, obviously. They didn't remember the blood on the doorpost. Turn with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 16. I mean, we, we don't have to go very far to see the, the issues. In chapter 16, verse 1, And they journeyed from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, they barely made it out of Egypt. They should be much further along than they are. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us. You brought us here to kill this whole assembly with hunger. You, got, you brought us out here to starve us to death. You're great. How would you feel? He just showed you the Red Sea. I just, you just had the plagues. It was a month ago. These, the memory of these people is unbelievable. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare that they, what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather. And we know later that was because of the Sabbath. So God answered their prayer. I will give you food. If you're hungry, I will give you food. You wanted protection earlier, I gave you protection. Prior to that, you wanted release from slavery, I gave you that. Not good enough. Would just not good enough. Exodus chapter 17. It's interesting the way that the, the, the Bibles that we have are broken down by chapter. Remember, there are no chapter breaks. They don't exist. But it's easy to read because it's just one chapter after another. Verse, verse 1, then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of Sin, boy, appropriately named, according to the commandment of the Lord and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people were very happy that they were and had seen God. No, that's not what they said. Therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. We want water. Give us water. We wanted food. Give us food. So Moses said to them, why do you, you know, Moses is starting to fray at the edges a little bit at this point. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, why is it that you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children, our livestock, not to starve us. Now you're going to kill us with thirst. So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And as we know, God instructed them to find water uh, with a rock. Exodus 19. They arrive at Sinai, and this is the giving of the commandments. Traditionally, many people picture this around or during the time of Pentecost. So it's 50 days, barely two months. They made it only to sign the, the Mount at Sinai. What's interesting in, in chapter 19 and in ver- in 20, which is where we'll turn now, we know that that was the giving of the law, but there's something very interesting about chapter 20 where we look at the Ten Commandments. You may know this, it may be new to you, not all denominations 
or belief systems that believe in the Ten Commandments count the commandments the same. They're a little bit different. If you didn't know that, it's, it's a fascinating uh, uh, a bit of research, is how the Septuagint, uh, Catholic, uh, Talmudic Jews, uh, some Protestant sects count the commandments a little differently. It's, it's all good in the end. But let me explain to you what the first commandment is uh, per Jews. I am the Lord, verse tw chapter 20, verse 1. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. They include the preamble, which I think is interesting. I'm not saying we should change anything. Don't, don't misunderstand. I want you to get the whole context of this, what we would call chapter 2. I have another question for you. How many of you in your Bibles have chapter 2 indented? Mine is. A few of you do. And the writers of my, or the translation of my Bible set this off. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This is up front and it begins. He gives the commandments after that, which we know well. The fourth is still to keep the Sabbath. But your mother and father, and about coveting. In that verse, in verse 2, it's considered prime that God delivered his people and removed them from slavery and he wants them to be reminded first, you were slaves. I delivered you, God says. I want you to remember that. When we think of the commandments, it all makes a whole lot more sense when you see this is the preamble, that God delivered his people from bondage. God wants this concept in their minds. You have been freed by God. You are free people. I am going to give you my law. And you are free to observe it because you are free. But this is my law because I've made you free so that I could give it to you. It's very, I think it's profound the way it is structured in chapter, chapter 20. The next section, we're going to move to the book of Numbers. If you'll turn with me to book of Numbers, verse thir chapter 13. This is a pivotal section, uber, uber critical. This is the juncture of the Israelites wandering that makes the, the, the pivot, the, the end game, the culmination of what they're trying to do. They're ready to spy out the land, this new land that God said he would give him, the land flowing with milk and honey. And the Lord, verse 1, spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each of, the, of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran according to the command of the Lord. And they went out. The men went out to, to, spy, out, to spy out the land. So far, so good. Journey's over. They've got the promised land. They've sent the guys out to, to reconnoiter it. No, 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 no. No, no, not so fast, not so fast. Verse 25, same chapter. It says, and they, the men, the spy out the land, they returned from spying, it's a strange word, they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. What took them so long? 40 days. They've only been in the desert probably two months. So these guys go into Canaan, what were they doing? Right? Aye. Verse 26, now they departed and came back to Moses and came back, came back to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel. And they brought back words to them, all the congregation showed them the fruit of the land. Then they said, then they said, nevertheless, there are giants in the land. The Amalekites are there. They are teeming and we, we are like grasshoppers. He, they say to them. Caleb tried to quiet the crowd. They're ready to stone him, right? It's, it's okay, we'll make it. God will protect us. We will conquer the land as he has promised. They're gonna stone him. It's at this point in chapter 14, verse one, so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night. And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said, you've heard this before, same record, different song. Only if we had died in the land of Egypt, or if we had only died, or if we'd only died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us 
to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should become victims. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's select a leader and go back to Egypt. Folks, let me tell you, I love you. If I was Moses, I would have said, ship them back. Can I help you pack? I have had it, right? I have had it. I think pretty much, I think if you read the text, it's not too far from the truth of what happened. So what's sad here, what's sad here, I think it's in verse, verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? Okay, so God now is getting a little afraid at the edges, right? He's a little bit afraid. He's heard this. I think, I think I know why. I think we all know why. How long will they not believe me with all the signs which I performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence, disinherit them, and I will make you a nation greater and mightier than they. He says this to Moses. By the way, my idea was better. Ship them back. He's ready to blot them out from the face of the earth and start all over with Moses. Now, we don't know whether this was rhetorical and God truly meant it, but if he did, this is pretty severe. Moses intercedes. He said, then the Egyptians will hear about it. Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. It's always Egypt. The Egyptians will hear it. For your might, you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among the people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face. Don't do this. Verse 20. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And we know what happened. They wandered for 40 years. They tried to go in. They said, we changed our mind. We're sorry, God. We made a mistake. We're going to go in. And they failed miserably in the promised land. So God said, not one of that generation, except Caleb and Joshua, are going to see the promised land. And they wandered, and they wandered, and they wandered. Going back to Egypt, Israel did not understand. They wanted the old life. They wanted the way that it was. They wanted, um, where's... Um, Leeks and onions. What, what verse is that, David? Right. Leeks and onions. David and I were talking last night. I want to go back to Numbers 11. I want to go back to the leeks and onions. I want to go back to what was. It's better than this mess that God has put me in. That sounds severe. But that's exactly what happened. They didn't care for where they were. They wanted to go back to what was safe, relatively, known. They knew what to expect. They had Stockholm Syndrome. Yes, it was bondage, it was slavery, it was horrible treatment. They knew and they could see what Pharaoh could do. It didn't matter. It was better than this. It was better than this mess. No, it wasn't. It's illogical. They ignored over and over and over again all the miracles that God had performed. And many of us can have a crisis of faith through our life. You know, the... It was, it was important uh, the other night, many of us commented how many young people we had at Passover, and we're very grateful that you were here. But it's important to understand the background of the Passover when we take the one we took just a few nights ago. In Luke chapter 22, if you'll turn there with me, it's something we reference in Luke chapter 22 during that night. In Luke chapter 22, we'll pick it up in verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, and when the Passover must be killed. And he, Jesus, sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. Let's be real clear. Every time this year, there's a lot of discussion, did Jesus have a Passover? He ate the Passover. It's called the Passover. He did not keep a Seder. He kept the Passover. That's what it's called. And they did prepare the Passover. He says, verse 14, When the hour had come, Jesus sat down with the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with desire, I have desired, this earnest, heavy desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He says he took the cup, gave thanks, taken, divided among you. He took the bread and gave thanks, and we know the rest of the ceremony. He says, verse 20, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Shed for you. But behold, the hand of the betrayer is with me on this table. It was Jesus' last night on earth. It was the Passover. 
That is how important these days are, the, the day that he picked of all days and the holy days. With all the understanding of the Exodus, Jesus kept the Passover as the disciples. They were there to be reminded and remember God's saving acts of Israel. And Jesus was about to perform another. What's interesting is that in front of his table, just like you and your dinner last night or any dinner you have, you may have vegetables, you may have some starch, whatever you may have, some meat, fish, whatever it is. He picks out two. He picks out two. He didn't pick the lamb in front of him. And I think he had some lamb. He picked out bread and he picked out wine. Of all the things he could have picked out, and we did what we feel as close as we can imagine, we reenacted that night a few nights ago. Nothing has changed. Everything has changed because Christ is the Passover lamb. It's emblematic of the lamb at Passover 3,500 years ago. I want to close out in Romans chapter 6. There's a lot of places to go. We, I, could, I could tell you to go to Hebrews 3, 4, which talks about the people of Israel and their stiff-necked attitude toward God. I could reference 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that says that the, the, the rock that followed the Israelites in the wilderness, it was Christ, but I want to go to Romans 6. When we have baptism, and again, so many young people have been recently baptized, and we're so very thankful that you have accepted this pull that God has in your heart. We go, many of us do, when we counsel the Romans 5, 6, and 7, as many of you know. I want you to think about, as we read through this very briefly, I want you to think through this of what we have experienced just these three days. Passover, not too much observed, and the first day of unleavened bread. Chapter 6 by Paul in Romans. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with, we are buried with him through baptism into death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Just like the Israelites, a newness of life. Baptism represents the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what it represents, this brand new life. In other words, we have been freed, freed from death. We have left Egypt. We have been released from the curse of the law, which is death. The sin and pain of death, of the old way of the old life. Verse 5, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Notice there's this slavery bondage motif that Paul references over and over and over again. He says, we are no longer slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. These days that we are experiencing, Passover, the days of unleavened bread, and the wave sheaf offering built into these. Death, resurrection, new life. We always tell our baptizees, when they come out of the water, your sins are forgiven, welcome, and you have a brand new life. There's this old dead body, uh, metaphorically, laying in that water. The new person comes up out of the water, and they live a brand new life to God and Jesus Christ, ultimately to wait for our, our very present resurrection. Paul goes on, therefore let us not, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts. Do not present your members as an instrument of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. 
We have been freed from death. We live a new life according to God's precepts with his spirit. We are not to return to the old life. God is very, very clear. The old life is past. As the Israelites were freed by the blood of Elam, we therefore are redeemed. In our former lives, we cared very little for righteousness. I didn't, couldn't care less, didn't matter. What fruit did it bear, Paul says later in this chapter? He says this fruit of unrighteousness bore shame. When we look back on it, in many ways it is. We should not ever go back to Egypt. It is a place we left, but should we forget it? I think we should. I think we should not forget it. Let me give you a few conclusions to ponder. The days of unleavened bread, which encompasses the Passover and all that it means, this is a week long, and all that it means, it calls us to remember God's grace in each and every one of your lives, to remember what God has done for you, that he has given you his spirit to obey him, to understand him, to learn more about him. And I encourage the younger people to do that ever more. This is a rough world, very rough. It's going to get worse, folks. The back of this book that you're reading on your lap, it's going to get worse, a lot, lot worse. These are the good old days. In fact, it gives us a reason to think back on the things that God has done for us through Jesus Christ and what he's given to us, and another reason. And I think Mr. Brown mentioned it in his message. Possibly it should teach us in some small way to have compassion on others. They're still in Egypt. I don't think it's our job to point it out to them. I think many of them know. I'll let God do that. He's much better at it. Whenever I try, unfortunately, when I've seen other people try to point out you're in Egypt, it don't go over real well. We should maybe pray for them, our friends, our relatives, that they too will one day see the things that we see. And maybe we'll see things even better than we do, because indeed we still sin. But those people feel they're in a good place, and we should never condemn them, because we should remember that while we were sinners, Jesus Christ died for us as well. And so we celebrate this festival, the release from the bondage that it was for you, and your bondage or your past life is far, far different than mine. Each one of your past lives are different. I don't mean past lives in the spiritual sense, I mean past lives in this life. But we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what God has done for us through him, that we understand the words that he gives us with ever more and increasing understanding. And indeed, we see two Passovers very clearly. We see Christ in the holy days. That is who inhabits the holy days, each and every one of them. That is our message, Christ in the holy days. But for now, we see two Passovers, the old and the new. And from that, we follow Jesus Christ.